Now we have the formulations of categorical imperative. Kant presents the single categorical imperative of morality with this statement. Act only on that maxim by which you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. This may be difficult to understand, but we will elaborate this statement in the following details. Although there is only one categorical imperative with that line, Kant argues that there can be four formulations of this principle. So, according to Kant, each of these four formulations will produce the same conclusion regarding the morality of any particular action. So, number one, the formula of the law of nature. Act as if the maxim of your action were to become, through your will, a universal law of nature. It is also called as the law of universal universality. Second, the formula of end itself, or respect for humanity, or respect for the person. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as means, but always at the same time as an end. Then the third, the formula of autonomy. So act that your will can regard itself at the same time as making universal law through its maxims. Then fourth, the formula of the kingdom of ends. So act as if you were through your maxims a law-making member of kingdom of ends. Though we have four here, but most of the authors of the books we use, they usually focus only on the first two, the universality and the humanity as an end. So we will explain now first, the first and the second formulation of the same categorical imperative, though it's important to note the thing that we mentioned a while ago, that these four formulations actually mean the same, mean only one uh, formulation of the categorical imperative, which is the previous statement that we learned. Anyhow, we will proceed by elaborating the categorical imperative with these first two formulations. Now, the first formulation of the categorical imperative is the formula of law of nature or universalizability, the ability to be universalized. With this statement, act as if the maxim of your action were to become, through your will, a universal law of nature. The formula of universalizability, or the ability to be universalized, commands, act only on maxims that you can, at the same time, will to become a universal law. This is not difficult to understand. It simply means that for one's action to be morally right, one must be willing to have everyone act in the same way. What Kant wanted to emphasize is that we should only do those acts which can become universal law. That is a rule of conduct for all men under the same circumstances and refrain from doing those acts which cannot and should not be a maxim for all or cannot be universalized. Applying this formula is uncomplicated. It does not require any computation. It simply asks a personal question, requires a sense of honesty and a bit of imagination. In the first principle, rest Kant's demand that man should perform only those actions that have universal repercussions. Therefore, one should not perform acts that cannot be universalized. Kant contends that suicide, which is nothing else but if done by all, can lead to the extinction of mankind. And not paying debts are actions that cannot become universal. In the principle of universality or universalizability, Kant argues that one before doing an act should first of all ask if the action per se is an action which one wants others to likewise do. If not, then it is not universally acceptable. In deciding most appropriate course of action, we are advised to do two simple tests to determine the moral rightness of every alternative act. So these two questions to test if an action is universalizable, able to be universalized. So Ask yourself, is this what I want others to do? Then the second is, think of a hypothetical situation and imagine what happens when all people do the act all at the same time. If we immediately realize that we do not want others to do the act in the first test, or we cannot will it to be a maxim for others, then it is morally wrong and we should refrain from doing it. If we do not mind others doing it, then it is morally good and we should do it regardless of its consequence. So that is on the first test. On the second test, if we want a situation where all people are doing the act all at the same time, then we can will it and can proceed to do the act regardless of its consequences. If, on the other hand, we do not want the situation to happen, then we cannot will it. Hence, we must refrain from doing the act regardless of the consequence of not doing it. 
So we have the case here to elaborate more the formula of universalizability. So it comes in handy if we apply this simple test. Let us now consider the case provided, which is the case of Mr. X. Mr. X works as an auditor in a big state university. Life is hard for her, a widow for eight years. She is a sole bread earner for her brood of six. A state auditor, she is sometimes exposed to various opportunities for corruption, which can add a little more to her major income. To her credit, not once did she exploit her powers and authority for her personal interests. Then the situation she fears, of course, her youngest daughter meets an accident in school and suffers a traumatic brain injury. The doctor informs Mrs. X, that is Mrs. not Mr. Mrs. X, that her daughter's condition is critical and requires a major surgery. The operation is expensive, but the doctor is stressed. It is the only option left if her daughter is to be saved. Mrs. X does all she can to raise the needed amount for surgery, but what she gathers is just not enough. Then one day, a university administrator sets a meeting with her and requests her for a favor. The request turns out to be anomalous. She is asked to certify to a falsehood, clearing the administrator of culpability in an anomaly. The administrator promises to pay her handsomely in addition to a lasting friendship and a sum of money far more than what she needed for her daughter's operation. With time running out of her daughter and with a rare opportunity in her hands, what would you do if you were Mrs. X? So, observe closely how the most ethical course of action is determined through the two-step process that we have just discussed. The issue in this case is whether Mrs. X ought to commit an act of dishonesty or not. Human emotions will tell us that if we were Mrs. X, there is a strong temptation to give in to the request, thinking of the financial reward that is its consequence. The financial reward can save the life of her daughter. We often hear from parents that they would do everything and anything for their children. In this case, to save the life of a daughter, regardless of whether the means is ethical or not, is the most ethical would just would justify the act of dishonesty and corruption. Unfortunately, what we feel right course of action any mother can do. For some, the love of parents for their children may sometimes not necessarily be the right thing to do. Feelings or emotions are not sure guides to morality. Our emotions, passions, and sense of involvement oftentimes blur our objectivity and the soundness of our moral judgment. Mistakes are most often done at this height of human emotion and acts are most regretted when the shadows of sadness, excitement, anger, or joy leaves men's hearts. This led Immanuel Kant to think that reason, not emotion, is the best guide of morality. And reason tells us that we must act only on maxims that we can at the same time will to become a universal law. In the case presented about uh, Mrs. X, if we were Mrs. X trying to figure out if it is right to commit an act of dishonesty, we need to apply the first test. We should reflect and ask ourselves the question, if others are in the same condition and situation as mine, is this what I really want others to do? The answer will immediately come to us that we cannot will the maxim that others ought to commit dishonesty or corruption. Our sense of objectivity will tell us that corruption is not right and it is not a permissible act. The second test will further show that this act could not be made a maxim for all. Let us think a hypothetical situation where all people act dishonestly, all at the same time. Do we really want the situation to happen? Just the thought of living in a dishonest and corrupt world will make us disclaim the morality of the act. In the dishonest or corrupt hidden world, we cannot trust anyone including the very people who are dear to us. People will no longer trust their government or any institutions. Unity and cooperation will no longer be possible. Hence, our human society would cease to be as we know it. We cannot possibly will to exist in such condition. Thus, by removing the element of emotion and temporarily removing in our minds our personal interests, it is no doubt that the alternative of acting corruptly and dishonestly must be avoided. Making decisions in situations like this, of course, is very difficult and the right decisions are sometimes painful to take, but living the virtuous life requires moral fortitude, a strong and determined will to avoid what is wrong and to do what is right, regardless of its consequences. So that is the first formulation of Kant's categorical imperative. Next video, we will learn the second formulation of Kant's categorical imperative.